Due to time, we have shifted some things around. Um, please bear with us. Um, our next uh, uh, presentation will be from Errol Franke from CPUT, and he will be taking us through Chat GPT. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> It's a bit unfair to place the IT guy between 100 people and lunch, but <laughs> I will bear that in mind. Um, actually, I do feel like the IT guy, because IT guys always wear spectacles and a lanyard, so <laughs> I'm dressed for the occasion, it seems. So, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I don't know if you've noticed, but I've certainly noticed, and I actually intentionally left it. If you look at your menu, uh, sorry, your agenda there, it says chat CPT. And I thought, let's leave it like that. Then I can also talk to you about Cape Town, <laughs> about what we eat, how we dance. I mean, we are humanities people here in any case. So that should be an interesting discussion. But nevertheless, on a more kind of boring and serious note, it's something that us as a department of IT at the CPUT have been pondering and debating. And we've actually extended this to CPUT, the larger community, where we'll be holding talks on just this notion, you know, chat GPT. And let me just say now, I, I mean, I just illustrated the point of tools, okay, earlier in my, my panel discussion. Chat GPT is just a tool right now of AI. Hence the reason why I don't necessarily believe in tools, but rather methods and approaches. So, but for now, chat GPT is the flavor of the day, so let's talk about it in the sense that and the question I really ask is should the higher education sector embrace or reject it? So is it Santa Claus or is it the Scrooge? Does it bring gifts or does it just not interested in, in, in Christmas at all? So <clears throat> let's think about that. And that's who I am. More importantly, where I come from. And if you're really totally bored one day, you can post me an email on that there as well. So Yudgoski says something interesting and I think we need to be cautious with this. By far the greatest danger of AI is that people conclude too early that they understand it. It's, uh, AI, even though it's been dabbled with for, let's say, easily 50 years now and more, it's still a, 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 a young field. I mean, if we consider anything else that we do and research in, in the higher education uh, sector, AI is a baby in that sense. So let us be cautious in just kind, kind of concluding that we understand everything uh, about this. So I thought I'd be creative, but hey, I've also learned doing enough of these kinds of talks all over the show, technology drops you crazy. So I, wa I wanted to be really brave and stand here with my laptop and engage ChatGPT and get ChatGPT to tell us these things, so I thought, Mm -mm. not going to trust ESCOM in the first instance, so let me rather do it at home and then um, present it to you. So this was my kind of engagement with ChatGPT. So here's that awkward question that presenters or anybody else does when they got the mic. So let me ask it, because hey, I'm on this side and you're on there. How many of you have engaged ChatGPT before? Just to get a sense of... That's awesome, and you all survived, which is great. So, for the rest of you, surely, unless you've been hidden under a rock for the last while, you might have heard at least of this, this term, chat GPT, right? So, just a bit of the science. It's a, lo a large uh, language model. It's an uh, instance of artificial intelligence. It delves, deals with machine learning deep learning, neural networks, algorithms, predictive analysis. It's all of those things when you're really bored, YouTube is filled with, with clips around what it is. So you can um, entertain yourself in that way. But it essentially, it was trained on, I think, one point many uh, data sets uh, or parameters. And it, what it essentially does is when, it, when you give it a line of text, it will predict what it has to say beyond that. I did a paper, I think it was 2017 or 2018, where I spoke 
in France around the impact of AI on higher education. And that time, I think it was a GPT-1 or 2 model at that time, um, where I gave it, the, 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 the experiment was a line of text, and then it wrote a 500-word essay based on that, and then I did an analysis of the accuracy of it. I found about two instances of inaccuracies in, in the text. I then took it to our communications lecturers and I asked them to mark this. They marked it, they, they graded it based on the rubric. That I then asked them, who do you think wrote this? They told me who, who they thought wrote it. I went to the clever professors in our department and I asked them, does it surprise you that? One, two, three, this is what the, prof, uh, the communications lecturers graded it at, this is who they thought, wrote it, and obviously the clever professor said, no, that doesn't surprise me because they understand AI. So chat GPT is not new, okay? AI, although it's a fairly new field of study, has been evolving over the last decades or so. The only thing that's really made it very popular is the processing power of these laptops and devices that we now have, that it is able to do this because if you dabbled with ChatGPT, you would notice that the response would have come within seconds. Okay. I then went ahead um, and asked it to introduce itself to you guys as the audience of DH Ignite. And I told them what you are here for on the day. And this is what it kind of led with. It said, it's great to hear that DH Ignite is bringing together academics from regional universities, blah, blah, blah. So obviously I can't read all the words, but I want to, the, the series of slides I'm showing you is leading to points of discussion for us. And I'm wanting you to un understand and come to terms with the fact that our students have access to this as well. It's not just for the sole domain of academics, right? It's free. Right, I then said now, explain in simple language and style how you work, and this is how it explains how it works. Now, key to using ChatGPT is the question that is asked. I think it's a point that was made earlier here. It's about what we ask and how we ask it, because you could ask ChatGPT this from the, as I could say, now act as a computer scientist and explain how you work. It's going to talk about neural networks, deep learning, et cetera, et cetera. If I said, now act as a six-year-old and explain, it will give a very simplistic. So that's the strength of what we are talking about here in terms of the context. All right. I then asked it, do you think that you could be used in scientific research for students and academics at university? If so, explain how you could assist them. And then it says, yes, I believe I can be useful, and it says how it believes it can be useful. One, as a research assistant, it can come up with ideas, it will help to analyze data, it will assist with proofreading and editing, for example. So it acknowledges that it can be used for scientific research. I then wasn't satisfied and I said, okay. So I gave it some kind of geeky thing. In fact, one of my students doing his master's in Geron Technologies, in other words, technologies for the aged, and I kind of explored that, and I gave it that theme around gerund technology, and it came up with a title. Now, of course, we could debate this as we do in higher degrees committees, whether that constitutes a legitimate title or not. The point of the matter it is that it generated some si kind of sensible title, at least. I then went further, out of sheer curiosity, and I said, now, Besides title, I said, give me the abstract introduction, background, and literary view of this doctoral thesis to a word count of no less than 2,000 and no more than 3,000 words in total. Notice the instruction, it's clear. The more you give it, the better the response is gonna be. And hey, there's the title, and that's the abstract. Um, these slides aren't gonna be made available, I would assume, to, to the audience, right? So you can entertain yourself there with what it said in terms of an abstract. The debate is, is that a sensible abstract or not? Um, this is the introduction that it gave to me, and that is the background to the study. 
I then wasn't inter um, satisfied enough. I said, now expand on this literature review section and write it with Harvard in text referencing style. I became more and more specific, demanding of ChatGPT. And if you look carefully, it starts giving us references. Interestingly enough, just for the time that I had available, one of these references didn't cross check. Okay, so be careful of those things. I think the authors exist, but the, the year in which the publication took place was incredible. All right. But I trust that I'm conveying the message to you in terms of what it can do. I then, being um, the postgrad coordinator that I am, I was more interested again in ontology, the epistemology of the study, etc., the data analysis, etc. I kept probing it. It gave me some kind of methodology that could be formed, uh, performed that suggested it could be a mixed methods research in this case. That's the ontology of realism, the epistemology, uh, ep ep that word I say it normally, not except in the mic here. It suggested pragmatism, for instance. Data analysis, now it started really interesting, uh, taking my interest here you know, in terms of the data analysis, but because, hey, is this an actual study? I started questioning myself or not, right? Suggested the results, it intrigued me even more because now you're giving me a results that, of a study that didn't necessarily take place. Don't we call that plagiarism and academic dishonesty in, in our um, ecosystem of research? It suggested a conclusion. I've um, had to kind of crop the, the, the screen so you don't see all the text, unfortunately. So, even further, now I said, now generate quantitative data for the results in this doctoral thesis. And to my relief, uh, I'm sure many of you feel the same. It suggested this. I'm sorry, and I said, hallelujah. But I cannot generate quantitative data for the results section of this thesis, as it requires conducting research and collecting data through various research methods. As an AI model, I can only provide general guidance and suggestions. And the, re the rest is yours to read. So it was... It came with relief. I really thought, oh my word, somebody's going to complete a doctoral thesis in a week <laughs> and hand it to me, all right? So that was uh, with relief. But look, gave me a, I just said 30. I could have probably said 100 if I needed to. But they gave me references to the study. Again, the, the jury's out whether these are all true and correct, of course, right? An indicator, by the way, that somebody's giving you chat GPT work is that their references will stop before September 2021 because that's the data set that it was trained on. Just as a matter of interest, I think yesterday or the day before, I asked what is the relationship between Russia and the Ukraine? And it spoke about some tensions that they had in, I forgot the region of, of, of Ukraine, but it couldn't give it to me the fact that they are at war. Why? Because it hasn't been trained on that data set. So we do understand this notion of where the artificial bit of the intelligence comes in. You, us as human beings, if we are so inclined, we would know there's current war between these two. All right? Whereas the AI doesn't know. And it speaks this whole kind of literature and talks around sentient, around um, the difference between human intelligence and AI is that ChatGPT, as an example, cannot express feelings and emotions necessarily that humans can. I would add in brackets in its current state. Okay. So this is what Stephen Hawking said. AI will either be the best thing that's happened, ever happened to us, or it will be the worst thing. If we're not careful, it very well may be the last thing. So, with that said, and my brief uh, by the organizers here today was simply just to lead some thoughts, and then for you please to help me as a scholar in this field with these thoughts. 
The first thing there is, is this AI world any different to the world Google created 24 years ago? Incidentally, Google is 24 years old, right? And this is supposed to be deep, right? So this is how deep I could get in coming up with this. How do institutions and academics equip students with the skills and the ethical mindset to operate in this environment? Thirdly, how do we design or redesign education policies for academics' integrity in an AI world? And lastly, how does AI shape the research outputs of the near future? Over coffee earlier, uh, our table was talking about this. Will a PhD thesis still look like the PhD thesis that people have handed in? Will it be examined in the manner that it was when whoever's got a PhD did their PhD? You know what I'm saying? So do we, do we measure that on that 500-word document, or page document, sorry? Or is it some kind of interrogation of the ownership of that content by way of interviews, et cetera, that the examiners will ultimately then pose to the candidate, so to say. So, um, or for chair, I know we are close. So, do I facilitate this? Would anybody, I'm, I'm keen to get responses from all four questions, please. So, uh, let, let's go with number one. Yes, ma'am? We had a few comments online, so I just want to bring those in. Oh, oh, so we got an online audience too. Yes, this is from Ingrid Thompson. Yes. She says, speaking as a librarian, ChatGPT is a big discussion topic in academic libraries worldwide. She continues to say that for research assistance, currently the library list serves are full of stories about false references, where it has made up references which look real but aren't. And then she offers to pop that into the chat and if any of the physical participants would like references, then we can share that with them as well. Okay, yeah. I think in some way I have covered that, that potential, yes, of false referencing, I do agree with that. Um, Prof Mino, are you gonna take a stab at one of the questions? So I, I was actually wondering what question that belongs to, but I think it belongs to a, a few of these questions. Yes. Um, so I, I, I think ChatGPT is great. It's, it works really well, but you have to keep in mind because the text looks so well, you, you as a human start to trust it. So you think what it says is true. And sometimes it is true. Mm. And then everything is fine, but sometimes it spits out nonsense, mm. but it looks like it's true. Yes. So you, as a human, will need to figure out, is this really a fact? It brings it as a fact, for example. Is this really a fact? Or is it, so you gave the references as an example. It gives it, uh, this is a reference. And it might be true. It might mm. be a real reference. It mm. might just be nonsense. So it's like a person you talk to who keeps on, you know, kind of claiming facts. And you don't have the, I mean, we're, so I can say, you know, South Africa only has 10 million people living there. And like, oh, yeah, I don't actually know the answer. So that might be true. Yeah. But I'm, I might use that in an argument. And all of the facts are not true. True. But if you don't check the facts, then yeah. it looks like a good argument. But true. It, it's not. So oh. I think that's, that's the scary thing about ChatGPT. So it can write text that look very good, structured very well. Facts are all wrong. And if you use that in a thesis, True. if you have a reviewer who knows the facts, mm. then it's all nonsense. True. But if you have like a discussion text, then that might actually be a good thing. So you also have to keep in mind, so I see chat GPT like a tool like a spell checker. Spell checker isn't always right, but can it help? Mm. Yeah, well, it helps me. <laughs> um, so you really have to keep in mind, what, what can I do? Where are the limits? Just like the spell checker has limits. Yeah. I think that's the, so I don't know exactly what question that, that belongs to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I think it belongs to, to several. Thank you. All right, I oh. think 
the side, yeah. right in front. Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> um, I just want to look at the first question. So it speaks about the difference between the AI and then also Google. So with Google, it's like a search engine where it directs you to different resources, hmm. which means you will have to go and actually find the resources. You have to make sure that it's credible. You as a scholar have to make sure that you can actually use it, so you'll fact check it. With the AI, with ChatGPT, like um, Prof said, the information looks, you know, it, it actually looks legit. Mm -hmm. So the question then comes in, um, would our students then think it's necessary to actually go find information mm -hmm. if it's there? Mm -hmm. And also with Stephen Hawking, he indicated it could be the end in the sense of, then where's our experts? So if we're not going to go and actually find the proper information, mm -hmm. or we're not going to actually be prompted to go and look for it, because we have it at, you know, in a split second. The question is, are we then going to have experts on these subjects? Are we going to have people that's just going to submit? And that's it because the references look correct. True. So, yeah, that's just my take. Mm. Thank you. Just um, sheepishly, I would suggest that we've been listening and believing politicians for decades. <laughs> Why would it be any different? <laughs> I think the scariest thing is they start believing themselves that it is true and correct what they're saying. I'm not quite sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, a very insightful presentation. Um, mine is a general comment, not necessarily speaking oh. to these questions. Yeah. You made a comment that um, AI doesn't have um, feelings. Yes. But then I'm just thinking there are soft words that do sentiment analysis. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering where we are journeying towards because from um, data, they are able to, sometimes it's not also right, but then at least they are able to see negative, positive, <laughs> neutral, you know. So uh, I don't know. It's not really a question, but it's just a comment. So yeah, maybe we don't, uh, they don't have feelings, um, but we are also journeying towards somewhere that we might believe that perhaps they even really understand. Yeah, How we true. feel about things. Very yeah. true. There's some computer science um, explanation for sentiment analysis. We can, we can talk about it offline if you don't mind. You know that it, it is, it's all about probability and count and yeah, we'll talk about it. I get your point though, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, Errol. Hi. Thank you. Thank you very much for that and bringing yes. it into this space. Um, I mean, I, I use chat every day um, and I, I use it's it. It's got a nickname um, now. It's called chat. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, my, it's my think buddy. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the lady who was just talking about the person, I say thank you and please to chat. And uh, the only reason is, I, you know, if AI takes over and the bots take over, then at least, you know, if they check, if they check my relationship, they know that. <laughs> You're safe. <laughs> so I'm working with a plan. <laughs> and hopefully it works for, for the generations to come as well. I, I told my daughter who's 14 years and she said, but mom, you're just being yourself. And I was, I was thinking about that authenticity, authentic engagement with... Yeah. The screen. But what I wanted to share with you quickly is um, I, I've done an exercise with my students for planning research uh, where I want to introduce them to chat and also help them to think with it. And um, so I, I, I developed just out of my bit of experience, I, I developed a little a method for them. And it has only three things. Hmm. And it has um, that they have to ask chat GPT questions mm. and they take that text and they put it in a table and the table has three elements on the on the um, on the vertical and those elements are novelty authenticity and hallucination mm. so novelty is something in the text that you haven't thought of before mm. uh, so that's where the think buddy aspect comes in mm. and then the authenticity is uh, something that you know from your professional experience or your personal experience is true. Mm -hmm. So something on that topic that you know is true. So you can color code that and make it green. It's okay. Mm. We know it's true. Mm. And hallucination or bias is all the red stuff, the things yeah. that I need to go and check. Right. Uh, there's, uh, there's something I'm not feeling comfortable about this. Mm -hmm. 
So I need to go and do my homework and be the professional that I need to be and go and check the hallucination in it. Wonderful. I think, uh, Prof, two minutes. Prof Meno, uh, we were looking at what could be done. It's clear to me that an, a session around projects people have engaged chat GPT on might very well be useful. Uh, I'm not sure hello. where are we? Hello? Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, yeah, thanks for the engaging presentation. Um, I, I am of uh, the view that um, uh, ChatGPT it's just like a calculator. You know, I think um, in the next five to ten years, um, students would need to have it as part of their stationery um, uh, for for a number of reasons. Mm. Um, on the issues around construction of uh, sentences or language itself in terms True. of modeling language. True. Um, because I think uh, in Sepedi, and recently I thought I'm thinking in English, and I realized, no, I'm thinking in English, but mm. in Sepedi. You know, yeah. So the words are just in English, but it's still constructed from a reverse process. True. So the, the level of professorate and doctoral... Uh, production will just be stepped up, mm. meaning that the the ability to engage more in the research will now be, uh, you'll have time yeah. to do something that you wouldn't be able to do in the past. Right. You can do it within a short true, time. True. But what is going to be even more important, an expert must really be an expert. So you can read a passage and uh, <laughs> and not know your body of knowledge. If you mm. don't know your body of knowledge, you won't be able to, to move forward anymore because anything looks relatively you know, uh, okay. Yeah. So the ability for a researcher to understand the distinct uh, difference between you know, validity, congruence, and corroboration or association or those things now need to be a reality. It can be something that sort of kind of sound good or Correct. sound real, yes. you know, and, and who said it in particular, you know. So, so GPT just answered you, did you hear that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So who, who said it Jeez. in particular? So the issue of research, the elevation of quality of research has to go to the next level. And um, I think one of the uh, key areas is uh, the time to also be able to develop new methodologies mm. in research. Uh, um, and, and also, it, it, it actually just comes nicely with this kind of setting where we're talking about digital humanities True. and uh, uh, where we don't have yet you know, combined approaches. And uh, in that kind of format and in that kind of space where you can do, you don't have to worry about processing what mm. you are saying you, have, you just worry about what you are trying to do, mm. then it means that you have more time to actually do what you are Correct. thinking about doing. Correct. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I'm be at your guidance. Yes, we can take that question in a final one here, just to catch up for that 10 minutes late start with a oh, okay. break for lunch. Okay. Um, this is just a comment. First of all, I agree that most of the references are generally made up. You can't find them almost references. That's True. my first point. My True. second point is that when, I, when, you, when you showed that PhD that you asked it to write, you'll notice that the abstract was written in very common sense terms, not very specific scientific discourse. So it cannot really distinguish because it's based on probability. When mm. it comes to specialist terms, you, it cannot work with specialist terms. Yes. So that's, that's quite an important distinction. If you think that it's actually able to write something in a specialist discourse, then maybe you're not maybe expert in the field. You, you kind of pick it up as soon as it does that. So True. that's my second point. My third point is that it, it, it deals in probability. So it cannot distinguish between impossible realities and realities. So it will come up with the earth is flat, the earth is round, and it will deal with both in, in the same way. That's a third thing. The fourth thing, a link, as a linguist, Noam Chomsky wrote a book article yesterday in the New York Times about uh, GPT, is that it cannot, um, 
in syntax, it cannot um, understand um, grammatical metaphor. Mm. So it will not be able to distinguish um, certain kinds of examples. And, and I think he gives, I, I haven't been able to read the whole article because mm. it's, it's behind a paywall and, and so on. Okay, yeah. But if you look at it from a syntactic, it will be able to generate impossible languages that are True. possibly human. So um, basically, in summary, he's suggesting that it's sort of high-level plagiarism. Yes. Um, and I think those are the important things to take away from this. True. Um, yeah, True. how you use it, of course, yeah. is, is yeah. really whether you fall into these traps and think it True. can do these kind of things or not. Thanks. True. If I may just come back at that. Um, <clears throat> I would agree with, with what you're saying and add the words not yet. And the reason why I say that is the current training of this, I think, was one point odd billion or 100 billion parameters. The next GPT-4 is going to be trained on 1.2 trillion parameters. So what I'm suggesting that is that it's going to expand, and the more you teach it, the more it's going to learn in, in just simplistic language. And the reason why I say the not yet, but I did a talk at the premier's um, uh, some event for the Premier of the Western Cape to business, and I presented a, a talk on AI, and the, the speaker before me said, the one difference between humans and AI is that it can't create, it's not innovative, it, it's not artistic, it can't create pieces of work. And I got up and I said, not yet. And I, uh, the point again is, AI is able to generate art now as well. So, I, I, I agree with you, but I sense that it's going to get closer and closer to all of those, the shortcomings in its current state. All right? Mm. Thank you. A lot. Is this the last? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. I, I was bothered by question three, and I wasn't sure exactly why at first. And, you know, I think this idea of, of policies when, you, when you're working in a new space, it, it tends to, to confine and, and put us in a box of how we, how we may or may not operate. And um, then I, I was thinking about the word integrity. And I thought, you know, our policies at the moment, our assessment policies already sort of tend to, to address integrity, integrity. And then I thought the thing that perhaps bothers me with that question is we're talking about quality. Mm. So maybe it's about redesigning education policies for academic quality um, rather than integrity. Uh, so that was just a brief yeah. thought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. I got a big red card there, mm -hmm. and in football that means you're off. So, <laughs> Jay, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this engaging and interesting uh, topic on Chat GPT. It has been on everyone's uh, lips uh, recently. So yeah, I'm sure the students are kind of happy, but at the same time, I must say that. Um, I did read an article that one of the universities in Europe has actually decided that they will not be using it in their, in their um, academic work or even allowing students to use it. But I'm not sure to what extent will they be able to actually monitor that. But I think these are just some of the discussions that um, also show us that there is the human part that is still needed in, 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 in technologies. You can, not everything can be 100%. It's like um, we always talk about a, a tool we have, um, Automato at Sadila, and we always say that it can assist you to a certain extent, but we still need that human, um, that human engagement with the tool because you might find that out of 10 words that you have, seven of them are actually correct, but the three is actually wrong. That is where now the human aspect actually comes in. But yeah, these are just discussions that we need to be having and having and having so that we can um, 
have a, a discussions around digital humanities, bringing the digital side to humanities and the social sciences. So thank you very much, um, colleagues, and yeah, to all our speakers. I think we can break for lunch now. <laughs>